Hello, you two. Hi. We're very glad to be here and not doing this remote from Torah. <laughs> Welcome home. Thanks. Um, Thank you. How was your long weekend, John? We, uh, we were joking on Sunday. We nearly got hugged to death <laughs> after, uh, you know, hair raising 50 days in Torah uh, to uh, be greeted with so much love. My God, we got it all squeezed out of us. So it was amazing. It's, it's Tark, great to did be you, back. Did you take your dad out for lunch? Uh, I understand he played a big role in this, huh? Yes. I mean, my, my father's always been quite important in my life. My parents both have been. And ever since I was a little kid, he's uh, always known when, when, it need, when it was that I needed to come home. And he's always come to get me when uh, I've had to go. So um, really, in that sense, this wasn't too different. He, He'd flown to Cairo to he, help secure your release. Yeah. He had, yes. And he really did play a, a pretty uh, substantial and significant role. Um, so I, I think I probably have to behave and listen to him for a while now. <laughs> what did he do? What did what did he do to play that role? Well, I think the key, there are lots of political intricacies involved as well, but really the key to it is that he put a human face on John and I. You know, up to that point, we were the two Canadians. We were maybe to some the doctor and the filmmaker, but within the, the Egyptian establishment, we were really nothing. And to see my father, he's a very warm man. He's a very kind man. Um, I think the, that that they saw that there were these two people who were very much beloved, who who represented something a little bit bigger than just a couple of names and numbers on a piece of paper. John, we've talked about this a fair bit on this show, and and there was uh, angst about your uh, the detainment without charges, uh, and then um, celebration when we heard that you had been released, and then of course muted celebration because we weren't sure that what was happening in that time after you first re were released. There was a few false starts in the process to secure you and Tarek's release. Describe the first moment that you felt truly and completely free. We we got a knock on the door at one thirty in the morning, and they said we're transferring you to another prison, and so we're going oh. And then we get downstairs and they say, actually, you're free. And I, I, it, the belief didn't kick in. We, they give us back our belongings, like this empty prison and it, everything's echoing down the corridors and they're, they're giving us back the stinky clothes we got arrested in 50 days earlier. We're thrown in this vehicle with army personnel. We're told we're being taken to uh, the hotel, and in fact, we were taken to a police station. We just thought the nightmare is continuing. They're lying again, they're lying again. Wow. There have been so many. So I don't think it kicked in until we, then we were fingerprinted because, of course, we, we were down the rabbit hole and everything's backwards with Alice down the rabbit hole. So we were fingerprinted at the end, and then we, were, then, we were finally, then we were finally in the hotel with your dad. I think mm -hmm. it was senior dad that made us go, yep, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. And Tark, take, take, take me back to the situation before you were arrested. So you said that the protest you encountered near Ramses Square in Cairo was initially calm. You went to see what was happening. Uh, when the shooting started and the chaos ensued, why didn't you flee? Well, I th first, a couple of points. I just wanted to sort of clarify. You would mentioned it was a pro-Morsi demonstration. That wasn't our understanding and that wasn't really uh, what it was. There was a coup in Egypt in which the democratically elected government was, you know, it was quite unpopular and through a series of events was uh, replaced by, by what now looks like a pretty obvious military dictatorship. And the, basically there had been a development of a series of protests that kind of came up to this pretty clear climax of um, the, these protests. It was supposed to be a day of rage as they'd called it. But they'd been very clear that they would be nonviolent. That was very important to us. Mm. Um, when, when we showed up to the protest, it was. And we didn't see, at least with our eyes, any protesters who, who were armed or who looked like they would be armed. When, the, when people got shot, at that point, you know, I have, as a doctor, a very special obligation. And it's something that I teach my students, and it's something that I was taught as a student. I have a clear obligation to provide medical care. I have a clear obligation to be there. I have a clear obligation to stay when other people are not staying. So it wasn't a choice. It was an obvious thing that was going to happen that had to happen. And I appreciate it. You felt a moral obligation. Absolutely. It's not that I just felt it and it wasn't there. It was there. And John, you were, you were filming 
Tark, attending we, to the injured. Tell me why that yeah, was important f- to you. Filmmakers don't have a Hippocratic Oath, but we've got something similar or something parallel, which is we've got a witness. We've got the, the, both the, the privilege and the responsibility to witness. The, we, we were in, as Tark said, uh, the a still peaceful stage very, very early before the demonstration had really lifted off, but a body was brought in by protesters. They called out, doctor, doctor. Tark switched into doctor mode. And immediately they started transporting the body into where's a safe place, let's bring him to the mosque. It was all sort of improvised, and I followed with my camera. And we, that was the first body into the mosque of what became for the afternoon a field hospital. And I was filming Tarek, do- documenting, trying to save this guy's life. He was bleeding from the, the, his neck. Really terrible. And then someone grabs me and says, there's someone else. And the body started to arrive. And... There was this very clear um, need. They had they had a need to get the, the the wounds documented, as they were trying to save lives, and this situation just um, unfolded exponentially over the, those hours of seeing more bodies arrive, more doctors arrive too to help, and more nurses and more cameras. But um, there was there was this. I th- we lo- we both lost track of time. You, you, you both then become you get arrested, you, and you're and you're beaten, and you're held with others from the protest in a this dangerously hot vehicle. You're taken to Tora, a notorious prison with inhumane conditions. I mean, you must have been in shock. Were you thinking uh, at some point in all of that that as non-Egyptians in this mix of people, you were going to be treated differently? Right from the start, we were treated differently. It was I was the Canadian, he was the Palestinian, even though he's Canadian Palestinian. But there was there was very clearly, um, the, you know, uh, flags were going up for the authorities. But still, I think I was in denial, less experienced. I'd never been to Egypt before. I'd never experienced the Egyptian army um, in in motion, and uh, I was really in denial. I thought we'll get out after twenty four hours. I've you know I've been through protests at the FTA in Quebec at G twenty. We'll we'll get released. This is they'll understand. I'm a professor. He's a doctor. Blah blah filmmaker. And there was and 50 days later we realized how wrong we were. You you spend these 50 days in jail, brutal conditions. We've heard a bit about this harsh interrogation. You start and stop a hunger strike. Tark, tell me a bit about what sustained you, um, the both of you, uh, over this period. It's a that's a tough question to answer. I mean, I think there was a realization that. We, you know, speaking of obligations, we owed our families, you know, our our well-being and our sanity and our survival. And really what what I wanted to do more than anything was to get back out there and talk about these horrific things that we had witnessed. Truly, the, the imprisonment was horrible. It was awful. It was, the, you know, the second worst thing of that trip. The worst thing was the massacre and the massacre and witnessing the massacre and having to deal with these patients. And it was very special because they, the, the site of injury, like the place where they were getting shot was so close to where we were that I watched them take their last breaths, many of them. And it was different from what usually happens in a place like London, where usually the dead arrive dead. Here, people who were mortally wounded would often arrive to us in, in time. Were, um, were you aware of the campaign that was going on in, in Canada and around the world to free you? It was, our, our awareness was extremely limited. We had some very vague idea that there was something going on out there. But, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I really had any, any idea at all until we were released. And really people said to us, by the way. When you issued that statement and you were on the hunger strike, what was happening at that point? Did you fear that you were going to be in there indefinitely? We'd hit the point where we'd gone 45 days and all 600 of us who'd been arrested on August 16th were renewed for another 45 days. And this seemed, uh, it, it seemed like madness. How can you detain people without charges for 90 days? And so we, we hit a wall of feeling we've got to do, we, we have to take some agency back. So... We decided hunger strike was something the two of us could do, um, and it it flipped the prison out for sure, and we had to do it very carefully. Going on a hunger strike with a doctor highly advised if you want to try this at home. Um, so we were, you know, we we you know, Targ really was reassuring in terms of 
these are the things we can do and not do and not, not endanger our health too much, but make that statement. But the hunger strike was, it seemed, a turning point in terms of the many turning points that happened, many of which we're still just becoming aware of. It was one of the things which mobilized people. It's interesting. Let me ask you guys. I mean, John, you're a well-known filmmaker here in Canada, particularly in LGBT circles. Uh, you're both outspoken pro-Palestinian activists. Um, we talked about this on the on the media panel here on the show last week about whether the Canadian media had some responsibility to hide those facts for fear of your safety. Were you worried about that reality becoming known to Egyptian officials? Absolutely, because we, when we, we're we're facing the 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 possibility of the most ridiculous charges, you know, murder, arson, explosives, attacking a police station, being part of a conspiracy, they were saying you're Mossad and Hamas agents. And it's sort of like, wow, that unique Mossad-Hamas uh, double agent uh, conspiracy. And so the, the, for them to add on top of that sodomite just might be within the realm of that skewed army mindset of saying you're, you've come to corrupt you know, pure Egyptian morals. Mm. So we were, we were so scrambling trying to figure out um, what what to say and not to say. And then there was so much that we couldn't say at all because we were just locked away and the key was thrown away. We had so little contact and so much broken telephone. We did ask our lawyers in the embassy if there was any benefit to saying, hey, he's gay. What's it, you know, your your international conspiracy, international terrorist conspiracy theory Breaks down. has right. a few holes in it. Right. But the the other factor was, of course, if you... Google me, the first thing that comes up is gay, 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 gay. And our fellow prisoners were, their family members were, of course, interested in our story too and following and they found the website pretty quick and they found my Wikipedia page pretty quick. So on some level, there was awareness, maybe, but it didn't come up among our fellow prisoners who really, we, we owe them a huge debt. They really took care of us. They really made our stay in Torah tolerable through incredible, you know, just gifts of kindness and friendship. And for whatever reason, it was a topic that was probably avoided. You two have been speaking out since you were released. I mean, this is undoubtedly a traumatic experience for you. It would be understandable if you would take some time away or go into seclusion or, or recover. Uh, why is it so important to be speaking out, Tark? Well, again, I, I guess I'm going to come back to the whole obligation piece. You know, we saw something that we need to talk about. And you can look at it as being a little bit therapeutic because we're answering a need. The, the idea that um, an army can massacre civilians and that could be consequenceless is unacceptable. And currently that's what we're seeing. So from, from that perspective, it became very important for us to relay what, what we had experienced. The other thing in terms of obligations, really the people of Canada who had stood behind us really in a very wide and nonpartisan way, we felt like we owed them an explanation. What it is that we were doing, what it is that had happened, what it is that we should, could or would do differently next time. I mean, we, we really want to talk to the Canadian people about, uh, about our experiences and essentially show them who it was that they were supporting. There's so much... Um Love for you guys. There's a lot of, um, there's so much celebration uh, about having you back. There's so much, uh, there's been so much concern. We felt it on this show. You must also be aware that there's something else too. There's this public debate uh, about w your judgment. Uh, and, and there's some media uh, folks who are saying this is, you brought this on yourself. You were in a volatile place. If you look at the comment sections of articles about you in the Globe and Mail, I would recommend you don't ever look at comment sections in general, but, but you know, they call you grandstanders and, and, uh, um, and I don't want to be insensitive, but I want to, you to, to give you a chance to clear the, the air about anything you want to say about that uh, element of what's come out. John? I think um, people should always remember where we were going. We were going to Gaza. We weren't going to Egypt. We were stuck in Cairo for a day because of the situation that was on the ground there, which we had no idea about because we were flying. We were in the air when it was happening. So we landed on a Thursday and we realized we're not going to be going anywhere on the Friday. And as a, as a doctor and a filmmaker, to sit in our hotel room and ignore a protest, which is half a, half a, or a few kilometers away, when so much of the work we do is, is directly connected to... These things are connected. What's going on? The protesters in Egypt are connected to the occupation of Gaza. 
Um, the 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 histories of Israel and Egypt are, and and Palestine are intimately connected. So there was some responsibility to go out and witness. Um, we we um, tried to be as safe as we could. As we've said when we arrived back at the airport, we're also aware of the mistakes we made, judgment calls. But I think important for people also to remember that Tarek's been going to Gaza through Egypt for many years, leading delegations. He led one of the most successful medical delegations of 16 doctors. In each case, there's something going on. There's something on the ground. He was there for the November War. He was there with the delegation when a riot broke out on the border. There's always something going on in the Middle East. So making judgment calls is easy in hindsight. As activists, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, I think one of the things is when you're working in occupied uh, territory like the Gaza Strip, the people around it, you know, Israel or, and Egypt in this case, don't really want to make it all that easy for you because making it easy is providing some relief to the people in Gaza. And really the whole purpose of the siege that's on Gaza is collective punishment. So if you, if you, sort of poke holes into this collective punishment if you create, as it were, like humanitar- humanitarian corridors, which is really what we were trying to do. We weren't trying to get involved in politics. We were just trying to open up a space for Palestinian patients to get treated in a way that was appropriate. As outspoken activists, there's been, uh, I mean, there's some interesting bedfellows uh, to, in this case where John Baird, Stephen Harper spoke out for uh, for your release. Um, I, I, knowing that that you call you talked about the nonpartisan nature of the support you received, does that change your perspective at all uh, in terms of? I mean, not, I, I don't expect there's going to be a revolution in your ideology, but but does it soften something knowing that there was that sort of wide support for you? I think there's moments. What it reminds me of the most is um, the support that Jim Loney had. Jim Loney, extraordinary uh, Christian peacemaker who was taken hostage in Iraq and held under very dangerous circumstances for three months. And I didn't know Jim at the time, and I found myself Googling daily updates, what's happened to Jim. And I found I was taking, I, it, it became so personal. And so that made me understand some of the hugging that happened to us on Sunday and the tears. And it, it, it helped me understand there's moments in the culture where the, the partisan nature of our lives breaks down and we, we reach beyond that. And so when we, we like to talk about, you know, the, the, the spectrum from Harper's letter to the kids' drawings, which, uh, you know, we celebrate equally because I think that that's the victory of this campaign and the victory of this support, what was, what was mobilized. And... You can't predict when those moments happen, but it's it's extraordinary to be part of one. It's really nice to have you home. Well, thank you very much. Welcome back. Thanks.